You're listening to Three Kitchens Podcast, a member of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. Now it's time to find out what's cooking today. This episode is brought to you by Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider in Alberta, offering internet, electricity, and natural gas with low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you choose Park Power, you are choosing a positive local business. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local not-for-profits that are working to make a difference in their communities. Shopping local is very important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski. And we love local here at Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Welcome once again to Three Kitchens Podcast. We are your hosts. I am Heather. Over there is Aaron. Hello. I almost said the wrong name. I almost said that I was Aaron. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday morning. That's how it's going to go. Okay. Yeah. But for this episode, we tried something that neither of us had done before, and that was to make sourdough bread, but not just sourdough bread but sourdough starter the whole process we made our own (laughs) starter right from scratch and then to bake bread and to help us and teach us a little bit about it we have a special guest you're going to hear from larry harris who took up baking and cooking as a hobby he sort of had always liked messing around in the kitchen as we all do and then he went with his wife for their honeymoon to Paris and really got into bread and was like, oh, this bread is so amazing. How can I make it at home? Because um, according to him, he couldn't find artisan bread like that. And why not go play in the kitchen and try to create it yourself? That's well, yeah. great yeah. inspiration when you go somewhere and you experience it and you're like, I want to bring this to my home. Yeah, exactly. So he used his time in the kitchen as a creative outlet from his day job, and he was making bread and goodies and cakes and all kinds of stuff. And eventually, he grabbed a spot as a contestant on the Great Canadian Baking Show, season four. And he knows his breads because he proved it by earning the title of Star Baker for Bread Week on his uh, season of Great Canadian Baking Show. Whew. So he's got a lot to teach us about sourdough. Yeah, I love that he comes to this from a completely self-taught position Mm -hmm. and he brought to us this fantastic recipe it's not even recipes he guided us through this this whole process because there's so much out there on sourdough and sourdough baking and it it immediately seemed really intimidating and so having him bring his method to this and troubleshoot with us and really help us to make sourdough happen. There were multiple pages of instructions and recipes. Yeah. Um, And that doesn't, that's not to say that it's complicated. It's just, he's very thorough. Yeah. And giving us different options, different methods and techniques. Yeah. And he talked about having a spreadsheet for when he bakes bread and he can calculate how much of each flour or whatever. He's like, he really, yeah, he, he knows it. Larry and Aaron and their science brains (laughs) came together and I just sat back and like, okay, whatever. I'm not making a spreadsheet. Oh, you know me. Okay. Uh, I can just tell you, we're going to get into with Larry. We're going to talk about the bread that Aaron baked. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just tell you that because I made this attempt at baking the bread after we recorded with Larry. So I'll just give you a quick status on that. Uh, And we don't wanna get into it too far because it didn't work out for me (laughs) so well. (laughs) I believe my trouble was in the proofing stage. I was too distracted and not paying attention. And I think I vastly overproofed my bread. So pay attention to that everybody. And um, Larry's got some great tips and advice for how to not only create your starter, but bake the bread itself and um Aaron you learn from Aaron's experience as well because she's how many loaves have you baked now I think I'm into my fourth loaf now so <laughs> I'm trying to do it weekly as oh. he suggested because my starter can live in the fridge over the week and then I bring it out on Thursday and I start getting it ready and then start making it on yeah. Friday and by Sunday we've got this loaf of bread for the week again and it is really fun to do so one more thing we did a fun thing with Larry at the end of the episode yes 
And instead of a rapid fire question segment, I came across this little quiz on buzzfeed.com that was what kind of bread are you? That's right. I asked him the questions. He <laughs> gave me the responses and I filled it in as best I could for him. And then we came up with his response. So you'll hear that at the end of the episode. But Aaron and I also took the quiz yep. and mine came back as banana bread. Technically, it's not a bread, but everybody <laughs> loves it. It's <laughs> like, what are you trying to say here? <laughs> Well, I came back as a as a pretzel. Oh yeah, which, right. Which I'm a little bit twisted and salty. So. I kind of like that. <laughs> I think that's kind of accurate. Oh dear. I'm an imposter. I'm going around pretending to be the real deal, apparently. But I'm lovable. There you go. That's all right. You're lovable. I'm salty. <laughs> Well, in enjoy this chat with Larry. I hope you learn lots about baking sourdough. Yeah. Let us know how it goes. And contact him if you have questions or wonder anything, because he is a fabulous resource. Even if you've already tried to do it or you're having issues with something you're baking bread wise, he does some amazing stuff in his in his home kitchen. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he's so open to it. You can just send yeah. him a message on Instagram and he'll get back to you. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy. Hi, Larry. Hi. We are really excited to have you here today to talk about baking better bread at home. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. It's great to be here. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got into being a home baker? Sure. I think I've baked and or cooked uh, a lot of my a lot of my life, but I really got into baking after uh, my wife and I went on our honeymoon. And we went to France, Paris, and Southern France, and Ooh. just seeing all the, just enjoying a baguette, fresh baguette, and all the pastries and all this other stuff. It just was amazing. And that's not something back in the early 90s that you could really get a lot of in, in Edmonton or Alberta. Right. It wasn't as uh, easy to find as it is, is nowadays. And that's when I really started baking and doing a lot more baking and just getting into it then. And did you, did you like take classes or were you just self-taught? It's all been self-taught. Mm. I've never taken any baking classes. And actually the first time I took any cooking classes was a couple of weeks ago. I took a, a short course on uh, marmalade and one on uh, making candied fruit. Oh, wow. First time I've ever taken any courses. <laughs> all self-taught. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. So all of this home baking experience led you to... Season four of the Great Canadian Baking Show. For those who may not be as familiar with the show, let me just tell you what the description is from CBC. 10 amateur bakers from around Canada compete against one another in a series of challenges over eight weeks. It is described as an affirming, warm spirited competition that celebrates personal achievement and the joy of baking. And when yes. you watch it, it really is so nice everybody everybody is yes. so nice and encouraging i mean this is not your somebody barking at you and calling you a donkey for not getting <laughs> perfect feet on your macarons like this is like, <laughs> this is like very encouraging and just look like so much fun how did you end up on the show oh yeah so it is so much fun it's totally as it's described except i wouldn't say we're competing against each other we're competing and doing better for ourselves it just mm. happens there's a bunch of other people around us it was a long journey <laughs> <laughs> so great canadian baking show is kind of a sister show for the great british bake-off and okay. so i started watching that and really really enjoyed that and then when it got announced that the great canadian baking show was going to be on i applied that that first year didn't get a get a, didn't get an interview that year. I kept applying, and I got an audition in years two and three, which were in person auditions, which oh. was held at the baking kitchens for Nate, which is a technology school here in Edmonton. So you actually went there and you baked something there. They give you like a little mini technical bake to do, and you had to bring something in to show them what uh, what you could do and have them taste, and they'd interview you and talk to you. And uh, and then uh, COVID came along, and it kind of delayed things because it uh, impacted their normal auditioning process. And I did a virtual audition with them and uh, got on in 2020, which was when they filmed uh, season four, and it was magical. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I That's mean, a really like... cool process to go through. Yeah, there's not a lot of people in each season. 
No, there's there's yeah. 10. So now there's it's six seasons in. So there's 60 people. You're close with the people that you're with on your season. And then you're also close with everyone else as well. And we also get together whenever we can in, in different cities. I was uh, just recently in Vancouver and I uh, got together with uh, Sheldon, who was on my season, and uh, also Lauren, who was the winner of season six, and also got together with uh, Karen, who was on season five. That's oh, so. fantastic. What an awesome yeah. community. Mm -hmm. So what did you have to do to get ready? Did you feel like you had to like, we, we recently had someone on the show who competed in a, in a Netflix bartending competition show, um, yeah. which I, which would not be called warm spirited and <laughs> spirited. It was spirited for sure. <laughs> um, she spent an awful lot of time in advance, like learning skills that she thought she might need and didn't know for sure if she would like, how much do you get? in advance that you need to work on? For, for people not familiar with the show, there's three kind of segments on the show. There's a signature bake, which is something you would typically bake. And then there's a technical, which you're just given a recipe, it's missing information, you have to figure it out and produce something that looks what they want it to look like. And then there's the showstopper, which uh, is something grand and something you'd never make because no one ever makes three tiered cake for their family. Is this not something you do? Yeah. <laughs> So for the signature and showstopper, they give you briefs in advance. This is what it's going to be for this week. Come up with a recipe. So you have to come up with an idea recipe, uh, get it approved by them to make sure that you're not everyone's doing the same type of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you want to get your recipe in right away so that you can do what you want to do. And so you, you can practice that. We start getting these probably a month, month and a half before the show film. So we can oh, practice. Okay. They all have to be your own recipes. You can't pull a recipe from a book and just submit that. They all have to be your own recipes. And then you submit them and develop all your recipes for all the shows. Mm. For the technicals, you need to know how to do things because there's going to be information missing. It'll say make chew pastry and you have to know how to make chew pastry because it won't give you any information on how to do it. So you need to have some technical skills. So, you know, do you at least get the list of ingredients when it comes to those technicals or is it totally it varies when you yeah. see us lifting the, the thing or telling us what we're doing, that's when we're finding out what the recipe is and what we're supposed to make. Wow. We have no advance warning. We have the two hours or an hour and a half or whatever it is to do whatever. So the recipe will often list ingredients. It may not have quantities. It may be missing a step. Uh, it might be just say make shoe pastry as an example and with no instructions. It might give you, it, they'll have all the ingredients there and you can do it, but uh, the technique is something you might have to fill in and make. And then you yeah, want to try and get it to look what they want it to look like, which you don't have any clue what <laughs> so there's often a yeah. lot of variation as to how things turn out i always find it fun to listen people are saying like oh i've never seen this before i don't know i don't know what this is supposed to look well i hope this is what it's supposed to look like <laughs> yeah right. no e exactly because they, they do film it uh two days in a row like just as it's presented on tv they have a signature and then we have a little bit of a break for lunch and then we do the tactical and the next day is the showstopper so usually at the lunch we're talking so what what do you think the tactical is going to be and we throw ideas back and forth and we are invariably not correct but uh <laughs> Sometimes we're close, but uh, fun trying to figure out what they might give us based on what they've done in the past. For the listeners, too, in case they don't know, each episode is sort of it's around a theme. So one episode is all about cookies. One episode yes. is all about pastries. One's all about bread. And that's yes. the one that you were the star baker for that week. Yeah, that was a, that was a great week. And they always, everyone some seems to have some sort of strength. Mm -hmm. And I think people knew that my strength was probably bread. And so the producers are always trying. So, so is this your week to win? Is this? And it's like, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say anything because there's a, <laughs> if you say things like that, that you're going to win, you're invariably not going to win and you're probably going to go <laughs> home that day. So <laughs> I was very careful not to say anything. <laughs> but uh, I was very, very proud of my recipes that I created for that week. And luck might be somewhat, the technical was making pretzels, which I've made pretzels before. So that was good. I knew what to do with that. Although they gave us a uh, lye to use, yeah. which was, uh, it's not something I'd ever used before, but it's something I would use forever going forward making pretzels because it actually makes a makes a huge difference mm. oh interesting i made pretzels for the podcast a long time ago i did not use lie <laughs> i was like that sounds scary i'm not going that <laughs> nope not doing that don't, don't, don't put your hands oh. in it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Now you're allowed to bring some things with you. And one of the things you brought in was cheese, wasn't it? Did yes. you made your own brie cheese? That's, yes, that is correct. I was like, what? Where do you pull that out of? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just made, he's like, oh yeah, I just, I made it. I just made like, some what? cheese. Yeah. <laughs> the short story on cheese is a group of us got together making cheese following a bunch of recipes in a book. We did this over a year and we met once a month and uh, we would make different cheeses through this through this book to learn the process and, and stuff like that. And so that's where I picked up making cheese. But I did make my own brie, which I think is pretty tasty. And Bruno liked it. So when a, a Frenchman loves mm -hmm. your brie cheese, that's always a... A good thing. I was probably a little bold with my uh, showstopper that week because I'd also made a, a board that was a map of France out of out of wood. That's and right. That's the right. breads were all French style breads and uh, it worked. You, you, liked you it. took a chance with the French judge. Yeah. Yes. Big chance. When you put it all mm -hmm. out there and for somebody who is French to get that that uh, yeah. feedback. Brie is relatively easy. You have to throw some different molds and stuff in it, but and you have to treat mm -hmm. it special, but you don't have to have a press or weight on top of it like you would with a cheddar or another hard cheese. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's definitely something that's approachable and easily done for in a home. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very cool. Mm -hmm. And then to put that in your homemade bread, no wonder you were the winner of Bread yes. Week. One thing that I found the whole time watching this is how intense the time aspect was just to get down to the point where you're comfortable doing those things as rapidly as you are demanded to is incredible. And then you get interrupted by people asking questions and things yeah. like that. How do you not tell them to be like, go away? <laughs> <laughs> you do sometimes. You do sometimes. I'm busy. <laughs> they actually do respect that. If you're in the middle of something and hmm. you, you know, just give me some space, they'll they'll back off a little bit but they'll they'll hover um <laughs> i am uh, my background is more using excel and stuff like that so i actually had just about every minute planned out for every recipe that i could look at it and say okay if i'm doing this step i should be at this point with the time or if it's at this time i should be at this step to help gauge how things are are going i mean they give you times that you can do these things in uh you sometimes have to take some shortcuts to make things happen in that time like like normally if you're making a custard you would put it in the fridge and let it sit there for six hours or whatever you don't have time to do that so you have to spread it thin you have to stick it in the freezer or things like that so you can get it in 15 minutes instead of six hours so you have to do, mm -hmm. figure out tricks like that to help with your time management, different techniques to do things quicker. I love the Excel spreadsheet way of doing things because that's that's what I think I would have to do if I was going to get anything done in that time, yeah. especially you, when you're doing multiple things at once. You would be fine, Aaron. I would be out <laughs> immediately. I wouldn't even make it on the show. I'm too disorganized. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, whoa, all over the place. <laughs> but not where it's kind of funny when you think about it because it's really not reflective of how a home baker oh God, actually no. bakes at home right? <laughs> like, you have time. How did all the dishes <laughs> the get dishes. done? <laughs> that was the other oh, thing. Oh, the dishes. <laughs> yeah, like, that how is... did you deal with the dishes? <laughs> I didn't have to deal with the dishes, wow. which is the wonderful thing. <laughs> and you just put them in this bin and these magical elves took it away. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But if you needed something, it would either show up magically because they're mind readers. The uh -huh. A big shout out to the crew that is the culinary crew that's either getting you ingredients or getting you tools that you need. Uh, they oh, do this cool. stuff in advance. That's one reason you have to do the recipe so they know what to, to give you in terms of ingredients and tools that you need. Uh, but also they're there to help you out. If you need an extra, another bowl for your mixer, you can just ask. Because they're all mic'd up and they're this thing. So you can say, you know, can I get an extra bowl or something like that? Oh, and cool. then it will... It will come. You don't see these people on the show because they're all hidden in the background. They're edited like, out. Magic yeah. of TV. But you just say, can I get an extra bowl? And that works great there. It didn't work when I came home because yeah. my wife tried to say, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you let yourself. But, uh, of course, <laughs> you got spoiled. <laughs> it, it, you really were spoiled. The background crew that you don't see are, are amazing. So fun. Big shout out to those guys and gals. Well, we have other bread to talk about. So let's yeah. take a quick yeah. uh, break to pay the bills, as they say, and then we'll be right back. This episode of Three Kitchens Podcast is brought to you by the Well Endowed Podcast. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the stories of how those endowments intersect with the community. 
The Well Endowed podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. Subscribe at the wellendowedpodcast.com. Welcome back. We are here with Larry and we are going to dive into the sourdough recipe that he gave us. Mm -hmm. I personally loved this because I did not fall down the sourdough learning hole that everybody did during COVID. I paid a lot of attention to it and <laughs> saw everyone doing it and was like, wow, people are making their own bread. Cool. I'm homeschooling two kids. So <laughs> <laughs> I have no time for that. But now we, I've been thinking about getting into sourdough and being like, oh, I want to try this. I do bake my own bread all the time. And this was like a match made in heaven because I got to be guided through this process very kindly. Like a kind judge. Yeah, exactly. But Heather didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, well, let's just get it out of the way before okay. we start talking. <laughs> I did. I started my starter. It was a, let's just say it was a non-starter. I don't know what happened. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. I could tell it just, it wasn't, and I'd ask Aaron, okay, what does yours look like? And is it growing and is it doing whatever? And mine was just not the same and it was not bubbling quite as much. And it was like, it, I don't know what happened, but it was like a dud. I started it again. I have one going now that looks much different. So I feel like somehow doing the same thing <laughs> with the same bags of flour and everything, I have somehow figured it out the second time. So I'm at day 10 today. So I promise I will follow okay, up so later when I've so made. Good activity. Yeah. Oh, it looks good. It looks much different. So that's how I know the first one wasn't working. So anyway, now we all know my starter <laughs> didn't work. Aaron's did. Thankfully, <laughs> she can. This represent. was a little bit. This was a little bit nerve wracking too, because Heather's like, <laughs> "It's on you. <laughs> it's it's yeah. your job to make this happen." And I was like, "Oh God, here we go." <laughs> <laughs> gonna have Larry on being like, so we tried and we failed. No, no, just one of us. No, but I, but not yet. I haven't completely not, failed. Yet. You haven't totally failed. <laughs> we made a starter, which was really cool to do. It's its own little beast. My son has recently finished his first semester in foods class. It's not called home ec anymore, which right. I was schooled on when, when he came home. They had discussed sourdough and sourdough starters in class. And so when your instructions came in, I said, will you help me with it? And so we started our pet, <laughs> mm -hmm. as, uh, mm -hmm. as we called it. His name was Joe, which we shared with you and is funny enough, also apparently your son's name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He goes by Joseph. Joseph but okay. Same name. Yeah. Yours probably liked because it had a nice name. Mine was Blob. It probably uh, just was offended. Yeah. There we go. It resented your yeah. control over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Joe was really loved. Everyone got so excited when in the morning we woke up and that line was on our jar and all of a sudden. It's way above. He was way above it. And but well, um, why don't we start at the beginning? Okay. Larry, why don't you tell us how do you make a sourdough starter? I've made sourdough starter and it's failed just like you, Heather. <laughs> okay. And I didn't let that deter me. I, I came across uh, this process where you use pineapple juice to get it going. Different flowers have different amounts of bacteria and things on it. And rye is one that has lots of good stuff to get things going. So you start out with some rye flour and some pineapple juice, and then you gradually start adding in your, your wheat flours using regular water. What the pineapple juice does is it sets the right acidity that the good bacteria and yeast are fine with and the bad ones don't like. So it helps mm -hmm. get things going, gives you a better chance of success and that you won't get some weird things. Because My first starter had all sorts of weird colors in it, which oh. I knew wasn't good. And then you keep feeding it a little bit each day after it takes about a week-ish and then he should start seeing some bubbles and then you start getting excited and you just keep feeding it and in and, and encouraging it along, talking to it <laughs> if you're so inclined. Mm -hmm. A little bit crazy, but you can if you want. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually you get this thing that's starting to double and triple in size and then it's ready to make your first loaf of bread. It shouldn't take a lot of time. Uh, the initial getting the starter going, you're doing something every day. But it's like for two or three minutes and then you're you're done. So it doesn't take a lot of time, but you can be making sourdough bread in two weeks. And the actual bread making process doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, hands on time is probably less than half an hour to make a loaf of bread, uh, mm -hmm. but it's spread out over over time. 
What is it in the starter or the process that gives it that sourdough flavor that we know is sourdough? That would be the, the bacteria that are in there. So there's yeast and bacteria that they're in the air. Um, and every sourdough starter is going to be different depending on where you are. Hmm. And you have a different set of bacteria and yeast in your environment than I do in mine. And you know, they produce different flavors and flavor profiles. And you can play around to get how sour it is by how much sourdough starter ends up in your bread. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can control that a bit. But it comes from the bacteria. The yeast gives it flavor also, but the rise. Mm -hmm. And by having less of it in there, it'll be less sour. Put a little bit more in, it becomes more pronounced. Hmm. And how does that affect the rise then, if you're using it, more in, in your bread? It doesn't, actually. <laughs> oh. oh, that's so interesting. You'll still get the same amount of rise because the yeast makes more yeast, which helps contribute to the rise. Oh, so it's more dependent on what you're feeding it rather than yeah. how much of the feeder you're putting in to make it. Yes, yeah. oh, okay. exactly. Exactly. You're controlling it by how much food. Yeah, it'll double in size quicker than if you use a smaller portion. Okay. But you can control the timing as how much stuff you put in. And you also have to worry about temperature as well. So when we went to make the Levain for making the bread, we then named him Levi. And so then Levi was our friend <laughs> for a day. <laughs> And then you baked them. <laughs> and then we, we baked them and we ate them and, and we made sourdough bread. She's made three Excellent. loaves now. Excellent. Because all these things are in baker's percentages. So you can actually take this recipe, put it in a spreadsheet and ah. adjust things. Keep all those percentages the same and everything will adjust. And you can uh, change how many loaves you need to make or the size of the loaf. And uh, this is where the spreadsheets and math helps. Now, first off, the most important thing is to get a scale. Use yeah. a scale for doing any baking. And then you can just play around with it. This basic sourdough recipe is based on 100% uh, flour. So everything else is based off of that 1,000 grams. And that's how the baker's percentage works. Okay. So you can play around with that flour within there. You can make it all white flour. You can make it all whole wheat flour if you wanted to. You can put some rye in there. As long as you keep it at that 1,000 grams, everything should kind of work out. And I put that kind of in kind there of. because if you start increasing the amount of whole wheat flour in it, it absorbs water slightly differently. So you might right. actually need to add more water. And it's just something that comes with practice and how, mm. you, how you use it. And you can go and experiment with different grains. Like this past weekend, I made some uh, bread using uh, red fife grains that I milled myself that came from Chatsworth Farms. Oh, so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I saw your post about that. That's awesome. Yeah, so you can do that. You can get spelt grain. You can get kamut grain. You can get einkorn grain. There's all sorts of different grains you can get out there. Uh, rye and uh, play around and get different flavors and profiles of your bread. What's the difference between all-purpose flour and bread flour? Uh, the type of wheat that is used in it. Uh, bread flour will have more protein in it. And in Canada, it comes typically from hard red string wheat. And that protein helps with developing the gluten and all that. Uh, ah. All-purpose flour will have less of that. It'll have a mix of grains in there. And it will tend to have a slightly lower protein. Hmm. Having said all that, we're kind of lucky in Canada. Our all-purpose flour is perfectly fine for making bread. Hmm. That's good to know. The grains we grow in Canada tend to have higher protein. And the other thing is, unbleached versus bleached try and use unbleached because it's just less chemicals in it and it it's a little bit more pure mm -hmm. uh, i like to use organic flowers and stuff just because they have more of the beneficial bacteria and things on it so that you get a better flavor better tasting bread and right. you tend to be supporting local farmers a lot more by doing that as well but the chlorination process is useful in flour on certain cakes and that because you need a certain acidity to make some of the things in a cake happen. Hmm. For bread, it's less important, but trying to get to something as pure as possible. So I got to taste Aaron's from Aaron's first loaf. The air pot, there was like an air pocket at the top of her loaf. So how does that happen? What happens there to create the distribution of air within the loaf? There's a couple of things that could have happened. It could have happened from the way it was shaped. It could be that it was not proofed properly. Um, so don't despair. Make another another batch. As she did. <laughs> As you did. Because it happens even after making thousands of loaves, you'll still get a little, oh, how did that happen? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's probably around the shaping and the pre-shaping of the bread. How was the second loaf? The second loaf was better. I found the first one was very dense. Yeah, the bottom was very gummy. packed and gummy. Yeah, that's a yeah. good word for it. And then the top was just kind of like there was that gap yeah. there. Like you say, there's so much information that and that the stretching and folding to get the gluten to kind of hold the air within yeah. all those little pockets. It maybe just kind of broke and all kind of popped up to the yeah. top. Yeah. So mm -hmm. now that you've given me that information, I am fairly confident that there was it was lightly slightly overproof as well. Oh, okay. I probably could have shaped it sooner. Mm. Uh, what happens when it overproofs? They tend to kind of they may look like they're right. They'll you'll get a little burst of it, but then it'll kind of sink down, and that'll contribute to the bubble forming at the top, and also that gumminess. Oh, okay. At the bottom, and again, there's a whole bunch of science you can get into testing the pH and when it's all ready and stuff like that, but. Mm. <laughs> You're giving her ideas now. She likes this. Kind Can of I get stuff. some pH strips and just test my? No, dough? you need to. Uh, it's easier to get a proper pH meter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to underproof than overproof. Oh, okay. So actually, what you'll often do is I can't remember the the name. It's a French name again. Uh, you will sometimes take a piece of dough and put it into a separate uh, thing, like kind of like a test tube. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that you can better see when it doubles in size. So you could do something like that. If it's a bowl or something like that, how do you tell when it's double the size? Yeah, sometimes hard to tell. Um, I thought it had something to do with my gluten. Hmm. Yeah, possibly. I went down that road and started reading more about the window pane test because I think I've read yeah. this in every recipe that I've ever made that has some sort of dough yeah. where gluten's developing, but I had never actually learned or done a proper window pane test. We hmm. do four sets of folds. Check it before you do your first one. There's a good way to learn. It's just going to tear apart. You're not going to be able to make the uh, window pane. Mm -hmm. Always do it before you do your stretch and folds. So do your first set of stretch and folds and let it sit for half an hour. You test it again. It's still probably going to break on the, the second one. Third one, it might hold a little bit longer. And then by the fourth one, it should be a good window pane where you stretch the dough out and you can see your hand behind it. If it's still breaking, do another set. It should be good. I don't think I've ever taken it past five. So there's a combination of factors, but I, I think the overproofing was the bigger one. So cool. I'm going to be making it again tonight. This is what's going to happen is I'm going to start this again today because I just, I feel like I can't stop now because it's... I've got the starter out. It's only going to take me a little bit of time and going through the process yeah. again and again because it's, yeah, it's mine... so much fun. Don't forget to feed me as you, you need your official taste tester. Oh, no, this is good. The, with the first yes. loaf that I tried, I mean, the flavor was fantastic. It definitely yeah. is a sourdough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you can you can taste it. It was delicious. The nice thing about it is usually it may not look pretty, but you could use it for croutons. You could use it for crostini or something like that. You make breadcrumbs out of it. It's mm. still usable usually. It's hard to fail. It would have to be really bad <laughs> not to eat yeah. it. So when we're doing this and we've got our starter, got it on your countertop when you're using it, how long can we put it into the fridge for when we decide, oh, I'm not going to make sourdough for a little while now. How long will it live in the fridge? I've done it for six weeks approximately. Oh, okay. So this is perfectly fine. About two months is about the the maximum and there's other ways you can you can stick some in the freezer you can dry it out and then rehydrate it in different ways oh. give it to heather if you're going away for a long time to i can babysit your to babysit it joe if you're at home i highly recommend just refreshing it once a week okay do that a couple times put it back in the fridge okay that just keeps it more vibrant yeah so when i refresh it do i let it do its doubling and go through its process before i pop it in the fridge or would i want to feed it and then just put it into the fridge directly. Let it do its doubling and then put it in the put it in the fridge. Well, I think it's going to be a little while before I do that. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I've caught the bug. <laughs> typically what I do is mix up the Levan, I'll have a little bit of sourdough starter left and just put in a container, put it in the fridge. And then it's there ready, ready to go for the next time. And if you get a bunch of black liquid on top because you've left it for two or three weeks, uh, just pour that off. What's that? Just alcohol. Don't drink it. Get some good gin or something like that instead. <laughs> <Don't> drink alcohol. <laughs> good thing you said that because you know i'll drink just about anything <laughs> yeah it just poured off it kind of looks gross yeah i would be thinking uh, something's i'd be afraid really of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. good to know <laughs> yep
Are there any myths or old wives tales about making bread you totally dismiss because they're false? Despite weighing things out, I think I'm pretty easy going. There's some people think that you have to be so exacting and people are going to see this recipe and say, oh my God, 48 grams. I have to be super exact with this. There's leeway on either side of these numbers. You can, as long as you're kind of in the ballpark, you're, you're good to go. Some people get really precise. They buy proofing things. They keep the starter at a certain temperature. You don't need to do that. Just feed it every once in a while and you're going to be good to go. You don't need to get a whole bunch of special equipment or anything like that. It should be something that doesn't take much time and something that you can enjoy. But if you want to go down that path, go down that path. Nice. I'm glad to hear that. That's good advice. It is important to be quite precise with some things with baking. So it's good to know that there's a little bit of flexibility. Well, this has been really fun and I... <laughs> I feel now like I've learned a little bit more. So when I attempt my starter, and I also have, I can, I can phone a friend. I've got two friends right yeah. here who can help me exactly. if I need help, which yeah. very well might happen. Now, we wanted to do something a little bit fun. We often do a rapid fire question sure. segment, but I stumbled upon something else yesterday. It is a BuzzFeed quiz called, which type of bread are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's like one of those personality quizzes and it's going to tell us what type of bread you are. So I'm going to ask you the questions as best I can. I'm going to put your answers in and we're going to see what kind of bread you are. <laughs> okay. All right. It says here, what type of flour do you use most often? Bread. I'll go with bread. When you are thirsty, how do you quench your thirst? I like to say beer, but it's, it's usually water. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite kind of pizza? Ham and pineapple. Oh, perfect. I can pick that one. Which hand emoji best describes your abilities in the kitchen? How about the muscle? Um, which type of oil do you prefer? Well, I'm going to say olive oil because butter isn't technically oil. Everybody loves butter. Okay. <sighs> Let's go with olive oil. Okay. Now this says, who's your favorite cooking show host? Anna Olson. All right, let's pick. With a Canadian. Yeah. Okay. Pick an herb. Basil. Okay. Which baking term best describes your personality? Uh, unleavened. <laughs> okay. Okay. Pick a baked good. The uh, pan of chocolate, the chocolate croissant. Yeah, me too. You are a marble rye. It says oh. you, you starred in an episode of Seinfeld about 20 years ago. Yes. Unfortunately... Your fame has died down a bit since then, but have no fear. You've definitely got a loyal following, Marble Rye. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with the Marble Rye. Hey, you probably do, but you actually do have a loyal following. Yeah. People love to see your bread photos. And yeah. Why don't you tell us, tell our listeners where they can find you and follow you? Uh, probably the best place is on uh, Instagram, Harris Larry D, all one word on on instagram the same thing is on facebook and on twitter although i haven't done anything on twitter for probably about three months now so so instagram is the best place stay tuned maybe some youtube stuff coming out in the future oh fun and i think i saw that the great canadian baking show is is auditioning again yes uh, in edmonton uh, they're doing uh, some uh, first live editions that they're doing since 2019 it's an open call so i'm looking forward to seeing past bakers and all the people trying to get on it oh nice Montreal, Edmonton, and then Winnipeg, I think. And are you playing a part in that? Yeah, I'm just going there to be a baking star, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me you get to taste test all the... <laughs> yeah, we get to, get to taste test. And I know there's a bunch of other bakers from, from that were on the show previously as well to cheer on the uh, bakers trying to get on the show. That's fun. And everybody, you can still go back and watch season four. And watch Larry in action. Yes, on CBC Gem. Yeah. So CBC Gem is the place to see the Great Canadian Baking Show. And I guess they'll have season seven out in the fall sometime. That's Fantastic. Fun. Thank you so much for teaching us about sourdough and sharing your recipe with us and um, coming on the podcast. You're the first baker that we've had on the show and it's been uh, educational. I'll definitely say that. There's a lot to it. And I'm, it's a little intimidating. And if anyone listening feels a little intimidated by sourdough, now we know. Don't be intimidated. Yeah, you can't really screw it up. You're still going to get something at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. this has been such a fun process. It's Excellent. very rewarding. It definitely is. And there's nothing, even just baking a loaf of bread and giving it to a friend uh, like Heather. And <laughs> I'm so glad you're like in my corner here encouraging Aaron to bake for me. <laughs> and the gym is always here when you need to come burn it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Larry. You're most most welcome. It's been very enjoyable. Love chatting with you guys, and uh, we'll see next time. Yeah, come back. Yes, talk about some other kind of bread. Sure. And now for the fine print. Join us over on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Pinterest, and on our website at threekitchenspodcast.com. And remember, when you like, follow, subscribe, and review, it helps more people find us. Thank you so much for listening. It could be a look made a lot smaller. I just have to use a different font. (laughs) 